Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special edition of The Man from Osirian, The Infernal Vault. We are going back to the year in the Pathfinder calendar of 4707. This is the year when Rise of Rune Lords comes out. And this is the year that I found that the Declan family that had a social heresy in Absalon, owing much of their rise and fame in close ties to the nation of Cheliax, had, well, let's say before they were kicked out and booted and yada yada, the whole bunch of backstory I won't bore you with at the moment. They have a townhouse in Absalon, in the center of the world. And we're going to see why that is key to certain events that are going to lead into the Man from Assyrian, the Pathfinder Society series, our take on the Man from Uncle, as well as into Mummy's Mask, which happens years later, as well as into and crossing over with our Echoes of Honor series, which will also run a whole bunch of Pathfinder Society material, which again props up and leads directly dancing into and helping out our Dice Before Dishonor podcast running War for the Crown. There is a lot of very cool material in set in about four or five different adventures, which we are going to mix and mingle. But today, going back to the very, 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 very beginning, The Man from Assyrian stars Frank Hamilton as Old Man Arif, Master Arif, the cloistered cleric, the scholar of Phrasma. He's not here, but in a way, he is. If he was to tell someone a story and say, this is my origin story, or this is how I got in with the Pathfinders, or this is how I got kidnapped, or this is how I got became an adventurer, it would begin here. This year, 2019, we have friends, family, super fans, as well as Roll20 enthusiasts audition for us. And I thought it would be fun if we did a game specifically with auditionees. Now, I didn't want to go it alone. So acting as our resident rule lawyer and sort of DM's aide today and filling in for a few voices here and there, NPCs and sort of cursory roles, we have Aiden Willems with us in the house tonight. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Not bad. Not bad. Thank you so much for taking the time on this early Sunday morning. I know you have to film Clinton's Core Classics this evening. And he also plays Poser Sham, our Jedi in our Star Wars Saga Dawn of Defiance campaign podcast. So thank you very much for being here today, Mr. Willems. Of but course, our... always have help. Oh, thank you. Thank you. See, we, we, we like each other a little bit when we're rolling dice. Moving down our list of players. Let's start with the job that I shouldn't be giving to Aiden. Jared, the intern, Mr. Jared Mercer tonight, is learning podcast at Rollmonger's Heel, as it were. And we are trying to teach him what little we know, but hopefully he'll gain the rest through experience. We've actually asked him to play his very own character, so he starts from the ground up. Mr. Mercer, thank you so much for being on the show. No problem. Glad to be here. Hopefully to have fun. Now, hopefully, um, if you're not completely familiar with the Roll20 browser that we use to actually do virtual gaming, because we do not have a whole bunch of people around a table, we play online and we record using Zencaster, and we record using OBS and pull what footage we can. Today is a little bit special because we are also using Roll20 to sort of throw up a little bit of a video. We have a little video action going on here, and uh, that will be either bonus content or eventual, you know, eventually, <clears throat> excuse me, free content. We shall see. But for right now, going down, continuing down our list of characters, we have a close personal friend of mine. I like to dig them up. A friend of our executive producer, Cheryl Ball. And friend doesn't necessarily get you in here at Rollmongers. You still have to audition. You may remember her short stint uh, with a little bit of audio problems in our first live show where we played, actually, I just said we never do, but we actually did this once. We put a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of microphones in one room and filmed our Attack of Opportunity one-shot doing the Pathfinder Society 2nd Edition playtest, Arc Lord's Envy, which is still rolling out to its finale and still being aired. As our generic sorceress, we have the lovely and talented and so excited to be back here gaming with me again, Miss Ashley Florence. Uh... I'm a druid, Jeff. <laughs> I was talking about it's... the former role that you played, oh, okay. not what you're playing That's today. Your muted Zencaster. Your muted Zencaster. 
It shouldn't be. See, these, these are the type of comments I'd rather you guys text to each other as opposed to talk about on the air. But moving on, this is an addition. It's going to be raw. It's going to be brutal. You're actually going to have a bit of a look behind the scenes because <laughs> a lot of it is not going to be edited. Maybe we'll throw in a little bit of music or whatever. But we thought we would share a little bit of the process behind the scenes with us today. We may not put in an attack of opportunity. We'll probably launch this as the men from Osirian, the very, very beginning, or perhaps extra content. Who knows? It's undecided. But what we do know is we have new faces today. And among those new faces is one of our super fans. Now, putting up a Patreon goal where you say, pay me a hundred bucks a month and you can play with us, or pay us $50 a month and you can play with one of the role mongers, like once a month type of thing, is a go-to for most podcasts. But becoming a permanent member, that would open up a huge gate of having a whole bunch of people just throwing down money like they do in video games to level up to the end. But I had to mention another Ashley, Ashley Parascuelo, Parascuelo. I'm really having trouble with her last name. I do apologize. We met her as a super fan, found us on iHeartRadio. Apparently, we're one of the few people that come up our podcast on Pathfinder. If you do that search, moved over to SoundCloud so she could make comments and comments she has. Miss Ashley Pasquello has brought new life to our dreary SoundCloud host page. Yes, we're on Spreaker. Yes, we're on iTunes. Yes, we're on iHeartRadio. Yes, we're on Spotify. But she has listened to the majority of our entire network and commented here and there, which drew our attention to emailing us, reversing emails, got talking to us, having her do a phone phone a fan phone call in the Star Wars game, which led to her getting a chance to off the record question her as a fangirl, getting her to question us, meet some of the guys that play on Friday night, and one thing led to another, and here we are offering her finally a legit audition. It is rare, but it is a rare treat when you can connect with a fan on a level where you give her a shot. Now again, friend, family, foe, effed up person you meet on Roll20, none are guaranteed. When you're podcasting, chemistry is key. Good player, bad player, do you know the Roll20 interface would you rather play on a table all that stuff can be worked out but you gotta have chemistry and that is our main test today they have made characters for pathfinder society they are not official though they are the 20 point buy versions with no crafting feats and we're gonna have fun delving into the backstory of the man from Assyrian. so guys what you're playing today will count it's not just some throwaway game. We are recording it. We need to test your chemistry with each other, how you do on the microphone, your own um, personability with the microphone and with us. A lot of things are sort of on the line. Miss Parscuello, am I saying your name right? Please tell me I'm... Pascarello. Pascarello. Sorry. I don't think I'm ever going to get that right. Yeah, it's okay. So today we're going to be trying to delve into the Infernal Vault, set in the year 4707. As I mentioned, it mentions the Declan family, which reappears in, shall we say, well, I don't want to jump ahead to the end, but you will see possibly a tie-in later, which eventually will boost our Dice of Fortis Honor and Echoes of Honor podcast, and that's why we're running it today. So going down the list of our auditionees, Instead of asking you about yourself, because I'm sorry, if you don't make the addition, this was probably a one shot for you. And we really thank you for coming out and be like, next, next, next. We'll jump into the juicy stuff. Tell us a little bit about you as a gamer and tell us about the character you will be playing tonight. Let's start with Ashley. Pasquello. I did that on purpose. You totally threw me off there. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I started playing Pathfinder about a year ago with a ex-boyfriend of mine who is still in my current group um, and just fell in love with the system. So I've been playing for a full year now. I'm in six different games, not including this one. Um, my character is a Kitsune who is a vigilante. So she uh, likes to help and uh, patrol her town and make sure it's safe. She has her nose in everybody's business. 
So you're the deity or the Pathfinder equivalent of Batgirl, so to speak. Yes. Okay. It's Catwoman. Catwoman. So for those in the know, a Kitsune is a it's come out of, it comes out of Asian culture and folklore, and it's become a Pathfinder race that's played on the other side of the globe, in Tensia. They are a fox-like race that stand upright. Um, I don't know if you've seen. Um, oh, where am I going with this? Anamorphic, I believe, is the term. But they have an unusual shape-shifting ability where they can take on the form of a person. And we'll get into that more. And then feats emulate. And if you've seen any anime, some of these uh, creatures have several tails. You get up to like nine tails and they're usually guard shrines. This is what the creature's based off of. Enter the Vigilante, which there's a ton of things you can do with that character class. But saying you're Batman or Batgirl is probably the closest thing. You live a double life, you get two alignments, you have a social life, and you have a nighttime patrol the streets life. In the very center, center of the inner sea, in Absalom, you have the city of Absalom. It is a major hub. And our Kitsune, well, we'll learn more about her if she's encountered. She is not a Pathfinder, but she is roaming the city this evening. Next, we have our intern, Mr. Jared Mercer. Hi. Um, I've been playing role-playing games for, well, since... The third edition of D&D and everything from that to a lovely little D10 game called Godlike. So uh, yeah, then reached out to Jeff and here I am. Tonight I'm playing a Unchained Summoner who has been sent down from Andorin. Is that how you pronounce that? Sure. Andorin. I see Andorin um, as sort of like the fa the game the Fable games or sort of a colonial America. Um, they're very they're very much into freedom. Uh, they broke off from Taldor and they they're sil they're like Silver Ravens go you know that kind of thing. Lots of flag waving. Yes. So I'm being sent down here from the Pathfinder Society to this place. Now Jared Jared is actually filling in tonight for a missing auditionee who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. And his stint, as, a, as he said, reaching out, uh, here's a fan that listened to our one shot for the second edition and is trying to write his own content and bring it and present it to, pass, to Paizo himself. So if you guys remember 3.5, where Forgotten Realms was the staple world after Greyhawk, someone won a contest and presented you with the world of Eberron, where the Warforged were a race, very cool. And it was in a complete world that you could um, you know, put yourself out there. So Jared requested of us if he could learn podcasting, what little we know from us, and possibly use that as a springboard to write his own content, maybe make his own podcast and present Paizo. So at the risk of us having him, setting him up to be our competition, uh, we are in the midst of our second edition trial. I can't say it's going over terribly well, but we trust in August there'll, there'll be lots of revisions and everything. Perhaps we'll see Mr. Mercer under our banner in the future, running original world second edition content. Maybe mo as most interns come and go, we'll, you know, be nice to him when he gets his coffee, talk behind his back when he leaves, and he'll go off into the wilderness. Next, digging deep into the pool of people I hope will do well. An old gaming buddy of mine, a friend of our executive producer, Cheryl Balls, and a spellcaster extraordinaire taking on a druid and revising a character from originally a game table when I myself was learning Pathfinder through one of their co-workers. Miss Ashley Florence and myself, several years ago, learned Pathfinder at my kitchen table together. I was playing 3.5 with Joe Gibson, who we mentioned before, for years, and my wife, Ashley, several co-workers show up and they handed me the books and they, you know, sort of shotgun taught me over the, you know, the, the difference between 3.5 and what we call 3.75. And here we are playing Pathfinder. Ashley, so much for coming out tonight. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm really excited. I, uh, I have to say that I'm very glad that it was, you know, it's you that got me into this. You don't give yourself enough credit. You definitely came into my, my work to talk to your wife and we had a great time chatting and, you know, I've had friends that have played this before and I always thought it wasn't for me, but it was your enthusiasm that got me into it. So today, yes, I'll be, you know, resurrecting uh, my elven druid and with my my companion, Roxy, and uh, I'm looking really forward to breathing some new life into her with everyone here. Now, are you 
playing the original archetype, the reincarnating druid? I don't believe so. You don't believe so? Well, we could make that so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how you do in the audition. But the cool thing about the reincarnating druid is if she makes it to fifth level, well, they're all first level right now, but if you make it to fifth level, if your character dies, they automatically reincarnate and come back again and again and again. And this was the joke back in the day that she had this cougar companion called Roxy, and we made lots of cougar jokes. Um, Cat, as well as the attractive woman over 40 that likes young men. And this cougar would maul the young part male party members in their sleep. And uh, she died a couple of times. And we were playing over fifth level. She'd come back. And it sort of became Roxy was the was the mainstay. And the druid that just helped her out became the recycled. You know, if you play someone that has an animal companion, they die easily. DMs hate having them. He's like, oh, oh, that's one comes out of the wood. Oh, who's that? Well, that's Ben Vereen. No problem. Oh, who's that? Oh, well, that's so and next and next and next and next and next, right? In this, Roxy was immortal. This cat kicked butt. And it was Ashley who held back with her spells. It kept getting picked off <laughs> as we played through the years. So hopefully, one last go. Bringing out what you know. Well, I also breaking a rule is we actually have Ashley stashed in another room of my house here, uh, just outside the studio. Uh, it's still technically virtual. We are in no contact with each other. There are closed doors. But um, to get her around the idea of from a gaming table space into the virtual space, there is this, you know, this audition, this um, baby steps. The next time you hear from her, she'll be in her own home with her own mic, you know, with her own cat to be the companion. Moving down the list, we have, of course, Ain Willems helping. And we'll be helping Ashley with the animal companion, possibly loaning a voice. If she ever casts speak with animals, that should be fun. Did I miss anyone? Is there somebody missing? Oh, yes. Well, Frank Hamilton himself is missing. I mean, this is the man from Osirian. Where's Frank Hamilton? Well, the funny thing is, Old Man Arif is here, but he's technically not. And you'll learn more about that as we continue. So, Pathfinders, are you ready? Did I miss anyone? Did we hear everyone's story? Well, apologies if we apologies to Matt uh, Damon and anyone else we missed. Let us begin. May I call your attention to the map of Absalon, which is in the middle of the inner sea itself, in the inner sea region. And in this inner sea region, yes, lots of pinging. <laughs> The good thing about additions and stuff is like, you know, well, you know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't totally ready, maybe, and, uh, oh, oh, here we go. There, that's much better. Let's move the giant arrow. There you go. Look at that. There we go. Obviously, podcasting, barely our strength, let alone, you know, any kind of video content. Not doing very well. Out of the gate. The Infernal Vault, which we're running today, takes place in Absalom. The city center of the world though everything i need is right here in front of me there is a bunch of lore pathfinder society adventures are great but they do kind of give you a bare bones get on with it type of deal so if if i miss anything or you know if there's something mentioned in here that they don't get it back too much you gotta remember pathfinder society scenarios are designed to be run in a single session at least that's what i'm told then we began our Dice Before Dishonor podcast, and it took us 22 episodes, which lasted over 12 sessions. Plus, I actually abridged it into the Echoes of Honor series just to handle messy content on the side. People have been saying, where the hell is War for the Crown? Well, if you check your Twitch, Twitter, and such, you'll find a little sneak peek that we threw up there recently. And I promise you, even if it's just episode one of season one because season zero is up dice before dishonor will launch before the end of january but right now we're doing the beginning of the man from Assyrian, another podcast that we are digging into playing somewhere in the city major cities you have an unassuming apartment a warehouse a bait and tackle shop a business that doubles as a Pathfinder Lodge. And the lodge here in Absalon is no different. The camera falls drastically zooming down out of the sky right into the center of the world onto the city of Absalon. 
falling right through a ceiling and you find an older venture captain by the name of Drendel Dreg. And Monsieur Dreg has a pinched face. He sits behind a stack of books that divide the front of his office from the space behind his desk. A shockingly old man he is with white hair and slightly milky eyes. He is surprised by the appearance of you outsiders in your office, looks up, half startled and half relieved. In turn, those that are been deemed pathfinders and not vigilantes roaming the city. Shall we start ladies first? Ashley F. Can you describe your character head to toe and who comes in with her that the old man sees? Oh, goodness. Describing my character head to toe. Jeepers. Um, well, you know what they say? Spielberg says less is more. Any defining things that stand out? Um, I think defining things for me is literally who comes in the door with me. You know, I'm your typical elf. and uh, But coming in the door with me is my very very large house cat who's uh you know <laughs> that's not a house cat she's a very well-trained cougar she's my house cat let's that's a, be honest it's a cougar now cougars <laughs> in the pathfinder book they go they don't go off a lion which is a very large creature it's a medium creature and it goes off of the jaguar unless you're using a very special cougar i believe and that's why she's a house cat no Come on. <laughs> no, she's my cougar. Um, she's definitely the more defining thing about me. Nobody sees me first. Everyone sees the cougar. Well, perhaps because um, you're walking around with a blood pelt cougar, very rare from the other yes. side of the world, very uh, from Taijian. Did you rescue I, this cougar? Was she an exotic pet somewhere on these lands, or did you travel to Zaitan? I, uh, I I would say that you know she rescued me, but I definitely rescued her, and uh, I like I like fancy things. I'm. You know, I may oh. be an elf, but I, I have a taste for fancy things. Fancy things, I exotic think, things? Yeah, I think okay. she's, she's special. We had a good connection. Okay. So give us your defining features, if you will. Height, um, distinguishing markings, tats, hair color, age. You know, the things that stand out. Taste in clothes, obviously, you just sort of fancy. Um, I don't know. I think I, I hadn't, let's be honest, I had not thought this far. Um. I would say that I, you know, have blue eyes and uh, very uniquely, you know, kind of shorter for an elf. And I think that's one of the reasons why people see the, you know, see my Roxy cougar first. I blend in with her. And uh, other than that, just, you know, I definitely enjoy just kind of being blending in so i'm not going to stand out very much with my clothing or anything because a little socially awkward i like to assess things from the back first okay so the cat is a distraction that makes you comfortable for protection as well as uh well it's certainly a conversation piece i suppose if you're socially well, awkward by yourself yeah and if people don't like me for my cat at least they don't like me for me okay very cool I believe a venture captain that's lived this long has seen it all, done it all. And like I said, as long as the cat's on a leash or obviously looks um, compliant and not dangerous and snarling or whatever, and also being familiar with who you guys are, because if as a pathfinder, you each in turn serve, you know, a faction, but we'll get into those in a moment. I'd like to hold the factions back. Cool thing about Pathfinder Society is you guys are a group, almost like international spies or you know seeking out knowledge and lore and setting the world right and you come together as a party for a common goal but within that goal each of your factions or the proverbial country that backs you there's always secret goals and it reminded me of the man from uncle movie that came out a couple of years back where they had the kgb guy working with the cia guy and the german goal right away and hence the name the man from Assyrian. but we'll get into him and who all that is about later having the different factions from Cheliax, from Osirian, from Kadira, from Taldor, from Aldron, you know, that kind of thing. Working together and putting certain differences aside to save the day. And yet quietly, they're going to do stuff mid-dungeon. And, you know, probably quietly just, no, oh, no one saw me do this because my handler, you know, said that, that kind of thing. Next to the door, we have Jared Mercer. Yes, uh, I'm playing a half-elf who 
His biggest probably noticeable feature would be his largely broad brimmed hat with the feather very reminiscent to a musketeer's hat. Um, he's got very worn traveling or adventuring clothing and in the door with him walks a um, almost uh, if you just look at her from the corner of your eye you kind of see uh, a very kind of celestial type of being but when you look at her cl more closely you start seeing the um, the more defined features kind of start to blur together and um, but she has also a venturing gear on and has a very large spear sticking out from her back um, as I come in the door I she goes first and I take a bow to the venture captain as I walk in and introduce myself as Kyler from Andor oh okay very cool. And can you spell that for me so I can, you know, <laughs> phonetically? K-Y-L-L-E-R. Okay. And now you are a summoner? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, as a summoner, do you have the Edelon in tow? Yes, that's what I was describing. The the woman that, if you look at her too closely, she starts to blur her, her um, features, kind of start to meld together. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Because theoretically, she's just a figment of my imagination in a way, brought out by my magical powers. Okay. So, a little uh, short staffed, shall we say? Usually these are written for four, four to six, but we're taking into account, I'm going to try something a little different here. We're taking into account the fact that we have companions, animal companions that are no guff. And when you play around a table, most people are like, oh, your druid's going. Now we have to wait for your companion to go. And it's like somebody having two characters. I mean, the Edelon especially really is a second character. So I thought, well, what if we just go with a, a slighter, you know, a smaller party and see how they do? Thank you for coming on such short notice. I've been meaning to give this assignment to you at a later date when we had, shall we say, uh, more Pathfinders available to serve you and with less uh, distressing time constraints. But it seems that time has conspired against us. He looks to you each in turn as if hoping that you guys nod or, you know, Understandable, understandable. We got here as quickly as we could. Yes. Yes, you did. Remembering how you just came in the door kind of surprised him. Drang mumbles to himself as he passes out a stack of notes and maps from behind the wall of books. Fetching several. These, these notes are from a recent chronicle. It contains some interesting finds, but one of them is now the utmost priority to the society. Drag lightly taps a bony finger on a map on which can be seen a section of Absalon with a small corner townhouse circled in deep red. This townhouse here. Hmm? He's like, holds it up, shows both of you and turns again, so you nod. He even shows it to Roxy, <laughs> expecting a nod. <laughs> Cat just ignoring him, you know, looking continue, upon. Continue. Yeah. Is a facade for an underground vault. Waiting, pausing, eyes going oh. wide, bushy eyebrows, you know, like big dramatic pause. A vault Hint like treasure vault or vault like underground dungeon? Seeing that he's finally gained your interest in earnest, he leaves the note in your hand, sits back down at his desk, leans back and steeples his fingers together. The vault belonged to an old noble family in Absalon that was expelled a decade ago. The Declans. The Declans? Yes. Does anyone have knowledge nobility? Or local even? That they care no. to have a stab at? <laughs> no. Knowledge. No. Rock. Geography. <laughs> he looks at Roxy. Roxy? No. No. You guys remember the Lion King? There's the three hyenas. 
when the two <laughs> couldn't come up with something, they just turned to Ed. And, <laughs> Ed? Yeah. Ed would just laugh. Yeah. Ed? Sorry, good sir. I'm, you know, more of a plains man myself. Uh, of, of course, of course. The family was forced out when their patriarch, a man known as Arius, was discovered to have written documents detailing this city's defenses. Shaking what a nod he? back and forth like a typewriter going back and forth. Like you, you see the, you know, the momentum here, the, how it's upsetting him greatly. Documents he intended to hand over to hostile forces loyal to Chiliax. You don't say. You don't say. I do. It, it's true. <laughs> the chronicles indicate that a copy of these documents exist within this vault. A pathfinder looking into the Declans and their chronicle references in Chelyax, our man in the field, as it were, was attacked and killed ten days ago. These thugs made off with a copy of his notes, I'm afraid, and, well, fortunately, he'd already sent us another copy. We have reason to believe it was the work of the Declan's eldest child, a young woman named Selina. She's the reason this assignment is so now urgent, you see. The fact that Selina and her forces were willing to kill a Pathfinder for this information shows how desperately they are to retrieve these documents. If she were to get these documents and return them home to Cheliax, it would undermine the defenses of the entire city, as well as cause the society undue headaches. Two fingers going up to his head and kind of pushing a drill into it, calm, tilting his head calm sideways. Down, you know, sir, calm, calm down. We. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, please, breathe. breathe. The Can society impors you. I I know that you're um, new to the society, but your reputations have preceded this desk. Find Selena. Find the documents in her vault, and prevent this situation from turning into one big mess for the entire society. But if you have knowledge that they have these plans, why would you just not fix it? I don't understand why these old plans still matter. Defenses in place of a city, tunnels, um, parapol like things that cost thousands of gold pieces and hundreds of hours of manpower aren't so easily sort of caved in or undermined it's it's easy for us to sort of at least take um our shot in the dark as it were to stop this from happening and retrieving the documents as opposed to telling the architects of the city and the engineers that they would have to abolish years of tradition and engineering employ just to crumble if no 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 trust me trust me this this we will we will obviously address that if it if it comes up later but um do you have any other uh questions miss yes. um i'm, I'm oh. sorry he starts fumbling through his notes like he's looking for a file on you guys would you mind stating your names because he seems a bit lost at this point again my miss miss kada my name is kada miss, miss kada yeah yeah yes miss kada um, I, I can, uh, do you have any other questions? Yes. Well, and what, what do we know about this vault? You said it was a noble family. This, this intrigues me. Is there anything written that you could tell us I, about it? I could tell you a little bit about the Declan family. Yes. Uh, Ar Arias was a beloved Absalon nobleman until 10 years ago, actually, when, when he was forced out of the city, uh, rumors have it that Chilex agents threatened young Selena's life and Orias felt he now recourse but to betray had no recourse but to betray the city's defenses I can only imagine the hardship the man had to endure for the safety of his own family uh, good sir um I tap on the uh the the building on the map and I go is there any uh, possibility to get better records of this area so we know what we're going into? I mean, at least I expect that I have agreed to, uh, I'll take on this this mission if nothing else, but is there any extra records or 
uh, information we can get about this area or this building uh, or anything. well let, let's see the the east quarter is is relatively um um quiet uh do you not have no lo knowledge local before you force this poor npc to roll dice i do like uh, this dice it's the I, i'm new to this town because i literally just it's, came off the boat this morning it's the pathfinder official mummy's bass dice but that's you know that's years away so i'm just using it to sort of represent uh, well never mind um well, uh, 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 oh yeah, yes, yes. Um, ah, Twenty. Look at that. It's lovely. It's a little scarab. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I could tell you a bit about the vault itself. I could tell you why. Like, getting back to the young lady's question, um, uh, why we can't just sort of forfeit the plans is the architecture of Absalon itself is quite ancient and there are lost tunnels below that um and if they were known to an en enemy force it would spell disaster for the city and i'm afraid the records themselves aren't quite complete other additions over the years have been made and like i was saying before it's just easier to recover the records as for the vault itself um i cannot uh, well, there's not much to be said about the vault. I mean, it was reportedly used to store a portion of the family's wealth and was ingeniously mm. trapped when the Declans fled Absalon. Uh, the family archives, where the documents should be stored, should be right next to the family crypt in the lower levels. Um, as to the... Sorry, I digress. The, I was speaking earlier of the East Quarter. Um... No, it was quiet. I mean, and, unless you take merit in the rumors of the vigilante. Um, oh, what was I, I had a report come across my desk this morning. Uh, excuse me. He starts fumbling around. It's like, oh, uh, yes. Um, yes, yeah, some vigilante uh, activity reported by the watch. Um, someone going by the name of Gl the Glove Fox? Fox Glove? That, that doesn't seem right. Well, I, I, I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's nothing. I, I mean, this this only popped up uh, within a week. It's probably just a bard's tale. That's, you know, an urban legend or something that's going around the city. I wouldn't put much merit into it. Um, any other any kind of good questions? So, just to clarify, you're saying that um, the Declans may be the only people that have the full understanding of the defenses of. Yes, Absalon? well, yeah, well, no, well, not of Absalon itself, but they have the 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 records of their own vault, of course. Okay, okay, just clarify. It's just think of it as a loose end. We're asking you to tie up as one of your first missions for the Pathfinder Society. Yes. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. Anything Sounds else? good. Yeah. Anything else? And we we can't just wait for her. Like, we are you expecting us to go hunt her down? Oh, because you know what, where she is. We've circled, yeah, we've circled it on the map. The townhouse. You could stake her out, as it were. Well, that's crafty, yes. But I'm afraid um, her vault is likely to contain many entrances and exits, and we only Traps. know that it, it is actually below the townhouse. Therefore, you must enter there and find her before she has time to flee via some secret tunnel or something that we're unaware. Um, traps. Uh, oh yes, probably plenty. <laughs> um, I'm. I look like between the cat and the druid, and then back to the old man, and then back to the cat and the druid. Um, well, it, are we going to get any assistance from the local um, Pathfinder Society or the? Wait a minute! Uh, wait a minute, Kyler. Why you, are you looking at us? You, We're you fine are... with traps. You're fine with tra I'm sorry, I did not mean to presume, but um You are the Pathfinder Society. You you are the help. I'm definitely <laughs> not fine with traps. Uh I'm only good, good then you can go first. No, that's not how that works. Um But okay. Mm. Do you have any other questions, dear lady? I think I'm good. Thank uh, look, you for asking them. Look, look to your training, young ones. Uh exploit resources on hand. For, don't forget that even a formidable foe such as undead can be turned by the lowest level cleric um, and those of ill repute could gain one as an ally and that is in the sort of supernatural world surely people in absalon could be bought 
Now, I'm not saying that the Declan's family members can just sort of turn a page, but there's if you wish to hire hirelings, I suppose you're too young, low, low level for a cohort. But um, if you wish to sort of uh, think outside the box and add members to your party, um, as long as you are can trust them or they you know will work in your employ and under your direction, the society um, doesn't uh, mind you know, extra help, but we're just saying, you know, you don't necessarily tell these people the importance of your mission, you know, just okay. make okay. friends, manipulate, pay off, quiet, Can't sealed talk. lips, you know, yes, well, it's a little rude. I mean, this is civilized in Absalon. We're not, you're not paying someone just to like take the swooshing Indiana Jones scythe that comes out of the wall or something. No, but there are professionals around, I suppose. So. Any other questions? Okay. No, I do not have any. Um, Wonderful. Could you, okay. could you actually quickly, and I gesture to my cat, Roxy, is there anyone here or anywhere here that I could get food for myself and mayhaps my cat? Oh, of course. You, you'll find plenty of merchants and, and stalls like on the way to the East Quarter. Like, like did I, I did mention that this mission is time pressing. We haven't had a chance to put together an entire party, and I understand your uh, your specific concern towards the lack of a, um, shall we say, trap springer, <laughs> as it were. Um, but I suggest you you know pick up something on the way and scout out the area. And remember, um, the townhouse is likely not the only way in and out. Um, Though I wouldn't necessarily waste time poking around sewers for like a different way in. I'm just saying that, you know, the Declan family would probably have a second means of escape. But um, yes, well, I, uh, I'm i going to have supper and I, I must okay. press upon you the importance of time. So if you don't mind, he's just, just kind of like <laughs> making fingers at the door. Whoosh, whoosh, off you go. I bow and swish my hat out and put it back on my head and come, Dina. Um Lady, please. And I, you know, gesture towards the door. Okay. I and, think uh, he wants us to uh, get started. Yes, he seemed seemed <laughs> quite urgent and pressed for time, didn't he? All right. May I have a perception a check good from thing. all those present? All four of you. Certainly. If I could find it. Yes. Well, just for fun, turning to your sheet. Uh, and we'll even speed things up a little bit. Um, now, an animal, not an Edelon is very specifically built and under control of the player, but animal companions are a gray area where you can command one, make handle animal, and the DM can have some fun doing the roles. So I'm actually going to task uh, Mr. Aid Willems tonight to help you along with, uh, you know, Roxy, as it were. Go for it. Why can I not find perception? Ah, there we go. Call them out, guys. What do we got here? All right. So my the Edelon definitely did better than me. It got a 16 on perception. Mm -hmm. I see this. And I got a definitely got an eight. Eight. And Kita? Uh, my perception is 14. OK. And Roxy? Was that a five, Roxy? <laughs> Roxy's hungry. <laughs> stomach is growling. She's not growling. She's just stomach is growling. She's not hungry. Stomach is growling, growling. Okay. Does she eat dried jerky? Yes. I think at this point she'd eat your hat. <laughs> oh, then um, um she's, yeah. she's quite she's quite excited about the thought of eating your hat. So I think the jerky might be good. <laughs> it's the feather. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> chasing it like a cat toy and just sees it moving and yeah. the cat's eyes are lighting up she is my large house cat <laughs> just keep telling everybody that all right all right so in the proverbial transition from the pathfinder lodge to the east quarter um it's not hard to, you know, find nourishment and any last minute supplies or a DM request going, you know, my starting goal doesn't necessarily talk about the mithril shield that I could possibly afford. Well, no, you can't. But is there any unusual gear or anything that you guys have just smattered on your character without consulting me that, you know, might need a DM approval? Are we going with those wonderful, wonderful ultimate combat backpacks? I particularly like those how they say, here's the fighter kit. And it has an affordable assembly of fighter stuff. 
that if you bought individually would be a bit more. It's like the, you go to the drugstore and you get that shaving kit and has a whole bunch of stuff you put for your teen under a Christmas tree. Uh, the only really special, special thing I would have gotten that might be a little out of place here is the weapon that the Edelon has strapped to her back, which is a Nagenata, the okay. Japanese spear. All right. So it's a Japanese style spear. So it's that might be the only thing um, that she is wearing or has on that is slightly different or out of place. Okay. Now getting back to the perception checks, it is only Dina and Dina alone that as he politely is, you know, still making eye contact and smiling and looking you guys up and down, his eyes seem to linger on Dina. And when you guys close the door, only Dina seems to hear him muttering to himself going, you still got it, Drag. I, th I think she likes me. I think that's her name. <laughs> Full name. Fido was just saying. Was it? Oh, oh, right. Like, supper. Mm -hmm. he goes. So, heading across town right away, getting something to eat. You're, you guys are cool for equipment, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I open up my, my coin purse and, and some malls fly out of it. Um, and something <laughs> will fly out of it. <laughs> some moths oh moths will fly out. yes moths some okay moths fly yeah roxy will chase those and have a snack thank you for the protein <laughs> yeah. there you go num, num, num. i'm going to chew on my my rations i have because i definitely didn't have any extra money for um that's okay uh, beef, beef jerky right yes okay so you're chewing away in your jerky and this outsider like i think it's particularly funny if I'm not saying either one of you is like a city person, but a druid, you know, buys the lavish meal, feeds half to the cat, you know, and you're sitting there chewing on your jerky, you know. Great. I'll have a water. <laughs> a cafe, the waiter comes in. You guys sit down for a moment and it's like, uh, you know, the cat sits pretty and, you know, puts a house plant on a decorative, you know, just blending in. And you guys are, the waiter asks to order and she orders all this stuff and turns to you and you ask for a water. Yeah. Yeah. He just you can looks. have whatever Roxy doesn't finish. Oh, oh, I'm used to that. That's good. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Right. Um, so tell us a little bit about what Dina looks like in public, because now I've had, we kind of skipped her with the old man, and like, we got this waiter looking up or down, wondering why she's just standing there with this ginormous... Which is look. actually kind of funny, because her charisma is only 11, whereas my charisma is 18. So, like, I oh. don't know if you normally do charisma equals how attractive somebody is but um well I, I actually go by a textbook um it's not necessarily how attractive you are it's your own personal magnetism there could be something right. about you your voice you know certain actors have it they could be ugly as hell and um and there's just something really cool about them you know the way they speak the way they move or whatever and everybody just kind of goes that's cool or they're just really pretty or you know that kind of thing that encompasses charisma uh at 11 you're no worse looking or no better looking or don't stand out any more than, you know, your common person. Um, someone serving would want to get business and would eventually turn to her and say, what do you want to eat? That kind of thing. Um, and yes, you and your foppy hat and obviously do stand out, but it doesn't necessarily make her invisible. Gotcha. So would you describe your Adelon? Well, she definitely looks like she has clothes on, I hope. Of, yes, she has clothes on. She has an adventurer's um, uh, gear, tunic type of clothes. Okay. Uh, but nothing that's going to provide her with any extra um, protection uh, to the normal person looking at them, looking at her. Um, she is 6'6", six, six, uh, very tall compared to me where I'm 5'8". She's almost a whole foot taller than I am. Well, th there's and, the standing out right there. You know, you know um, uh, she definitely puts off, like I said, the air of um, uh, a divinity almost. Like, you know, she definitely has been touched with celestial blood. Uh, the very um, almost golden skinned, hued silver eyes, um, very almost platinum blonde hair tied back into a ponytail that goes into a very but, intricate but, but plain looking with a charisma of but, 11 <laughs> but yes if you try to really look at her all of her features kind of seem to be very um normal no defining feature because generic plain you know um she is an edelon she is a creation of magic from the plains uh that is based on um something that i my character saw in a book 
when he was younger. Yeah, the summoner class sort of key ability is to sort of literally make an animal companion or an Adelon, as it were. Yes. Not really animal companion. From scratch. And one of your choices is a... Uh, well, so far I'm just seeing that you're a sick man and have your own walking sword wielding Barbie doll. Um, plain looking, but epic hair, and, you know. Well, yes, like it's one of those things that <laughs> until, until like level eight, the proverbial level eight, her, her definition doesn't really come in. You know, we don't, we're back to uh, almost silver screen kind of definition right now with, <laughs> with my head alone. We're not at 4K quality. Okay, um, okay. Uh, but she definitely seems to be the more uh, perceptive, the more um, almost like a bodyguard kind of uh, personality. You know, she's constantly, her head's constantly moving on a swivel. She's, uh, she doesn't talk much, but when she does, she, it's more of the like, you know, points out obvious things that I'm not noticing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so are you kind of going for the bodyguard? Like people would just assume that her actions are somebody like I'm paid to be quiet and just watch your back be intimidating um, and you know what i mean yes not giving kind anyone the eye that comes near but just kind of boredly just standing there and you know you know um i'm with him but i'm uh, not important enough to talk to i you know i kind of treat her more like an older sister than anything else getting weirder dude you know, i gotta say i know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you have a death in the in. family did you you know did yes, you have an actually like the sh my family died so okay so when you were young you looked up to it like i'm trying to help you out yes, here man because yes, is... yes no 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 okay. i didn't know how much <laughs> of a background you wanted from me so um my background is yes my my family died in a raid and okay. uh my older sister tried to protect me and didn't manage to do that very well pathfinder society eventually came around picked me up because of my magical abilities mm -hmm. and you know, one of the first things I did was make a guardian for myself based on um, based on her. Her and the picture in the book you saw. And, yes, okay. yes, yes. So you know. it was Dina your sister's name? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. So Dina you have, Silverthorne. You have issues. And Kyler <laughs> very cool. So, okay. That, okay. That's yeah, that, like that's... I was very young when, when yeah. that happened. Like, you know, um, now I believe, I believe you wanted to put a spin on this. You were inspired by the concept of, I believe, Full Metal Alchemist, the anime. Yes. With the younger brother losing his yeah. body and being put together as sort of walking armor and looking after a big brother who's lost an arm and that kind of thing in that anime. Okay. I think I see where you're going with this. And I hope the audience forgives the blatant <clears throat> blow up doll um, references. I'm not even going to ask about atomically correct and stuff, but I am going to ask about the cat. <laughs> okay a wild cat do you have like the studded leash the, the bling going is this like the the model walk supermodel walking down the street with the tiger kind of concept of hollywood or um the cat itself is a medium creature so it's not really the size of a tiger it's uh the size of like a jaguar or like it is a cougar uh which is one of the smaller shall we say predatory cats the big guts um roxy's roxy's demeanor let's talk about roxy's demeanor so she's, she's very a, tame or whatever it is like she just yeah, hugs your hip and that's it no she's she's not she's very obviously she's quite well behaved um but she, i would say she's quite sassy like you know with me she she definitely makes it known that she's got something she wants me to hear and oftentimes i choose to ignore it until she gets a little bit more forceful but uh and by that i mean like she'll start like nudging me around or pushing me into things or you know she'll get vocal in her way but otherwise to other people she is you know she's very well behaved um likes to not get in people's faces because we've learned uh over time that uh you know when she she enters the room first and she's you know all teeth and claws it tends to startle people and make our job harder okay now I've tried hard to do some things um, behind the scenes, and like I said, this is an audition show, and to give people a sneak peek, um, trying to present a podcast is one thing. A vodcast is we've been finding it Romo insanely difficult. Um, some things come up, um, a background, just having just Yale face, having the right shirt on, you know, having the, your background being your your laundry or whatever. Um, that's one thing, and most of the internet is very very forgiving. 
Uh, but if they can't see you, it's kind of a deal breaker. So Ashley, I need you to get a light on going, open the back window. Like you're just a big shadow on the camera right now. If you can see yourself, you need yeah, to adjust either, or turn on some lights in that room. I think I need to actually shut the window because sure, the, that works. the sun is setting. Yep. So that, that works give great. Me a second. Yeah. Now I know Mr. Willems can't uh, possibly kill the light in his room. That's fine. But moving, you know, without trying to uh, lose any of some of the memento, momentum, okay, let's go to the foxglove herself. Oh, yes, she does exist. And traipsing from rooftop to rooftop or moving disguised amongst the crowd or perhaps posing as a cart driver. There are many, 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 many ways to blend. When, shall we say, on recon of your city, while on patrol, what is yours? Um, right now, she is walking around as just an average height woman, a young woman, um, long, dark hair. Uh, nothing that actually stands out in any way, shape, or form. Just moving along the alleyways and seeing anything that might be important to her that she needs to check out. Okay. And... How do you pull that off, being a kitsune with a fox head and furry um, anamorph-type body? She um, actually has a feat, which is called... Pardon me, if I pull it up? No, it's fine. Um, because I believe you have the feat, and it gives you a huge bonus to disguise, which is a skill, which requires a roll. So I would like you to, you know, when you got into that disguise, as it were... Make the one static roll, and we will run off of it for perception for people, notes, guards to take interest. But the Kitsune are very good at it, because with your feet to like blend or mimic, it's like at a plus 10. Um, yeah, she gets a plus 10 unless she's in her social, which she gets a plus 20. But right. for this. And also we were discussing off-air a very cool trait called Deep Cover, which allows you to take 10 on these rolls. But she has a 19, and that would be a 29 with her plus 10 to yeah. blend in and disguise. Yes, well, sorry, I had asked for the roll, and you, you can always worry about, you know, taking 10. So 29 to blend yes. amongst the people of... Okay, so as a woman that's supposed... Like um, someone that lives in town or a merchant or whatever, whatever you're going for here, you just move it amongst the people. And as rumor has it, you've been seen around a district... And you are, you know, you don't believe your cover has been blown. Uh, the watch hasn't, you know, hassled you. You have some very, very cool tricks. Um, the coolest thing, one of the coolest things about the Vigilante class is you literally get to take on a second persona with a second alignment. Now, I'm not going to pin down or ask the player's alignments. Those usually come up when you pick up a sword or that type of thing. I'd like you guys to sort of like to play it out. Um, and I'd like to see you role play, you know, each persona. But we've kind of gone one step further because Ashley is playing a Kitsune that needs first off just to take a face to blend in. Are you saying that your social persona, the Bruce Wayne, as it were, isn't your Kitsune self? It is someone that you have picked and stacked up and set up? Yes, she uh, takes the form of a very well-known um, expert in a multitude of areas so she is very well known around town for being helpful and being able to help people with their problems like a wise woman or a scholar or yes. or the, the the bard that knows everything that hangs out at the tavern that tells stories without necessarily singing what are we going for there um it's, she's basically just a jack of all trades that you know if somebody has a problem they ask her about it and she can help them come up with uh, okay yeah okay so i think i know where you're going with this uh, i don't know about you but where i live there's these twin brothers and they have a truck and they go everywhere they do everything and everyone knows them because they anything lifted move the house get rid of junk you know that that type of thing they're the guys and they have a reputation for this so you're saying you're that person where you know you need some advice without paying for it or, or having to pay a sage or whatever you know talk to talk to so and so she'll probably help you out you know you know you have that kind of rep going yes. yep. so so for that kind of rep you'd have to be in the city for a little while so how long have you actually been in Absalom? She's probably been an Absalom for about five years. Okay. So slowly building the rep, getting to know, set up the social status, getting to know the people, and doing the vigilante thing, whether you're right out of the gate or, you know, it took you five years. But only 
a month ago did you possibly have people start talking about you? Only a week ago have the rumors really began to circle concentrated in the East District where the name Foxglove has been murmured, whispered. People speak of, you know, this vigilante and, you know, start speculating about your M.O. Yes. Which right now is blend, blend, blend and patrol and patrol. There is something interesting on one street in a townhouse that is maintained but like usually abandoned a large group of people have been in and out all evening you notice that there are people monitoring the doors and windows they are armed in light armor and they watch they seem to sort of all fold up into the house when the watch goes by they seem to know the watch routines or they meld into the shadows a bunch now having even up to 20 people would take two minutes tops to walk into a house and to have you right at the street at this at the right time is ridiculous however um have you ever heard that story about the thieves that backed up a moving truck to a house and cleaned it out and no one saw barb and margaret and tim and maggie that lived there but no one cared because one of them cut the lawn they spent an hour carefully cutting the grass while the rest of them cleaned the house out and everybody that looked over went oh well you know obviously they've hired movers or you know of course because somebody was doing yard work for all to see it's brilliant and these guys are doing you know something similar where they have you know they're they're checking windows they're they're acting like hired noblemen's security rattling doors or whatever but when you come by an hour later they're still doing it when you come by three hours later they're still doing it the watch shift changes which means different people see the same guys doing the same thing and if they come circle back around, these guys aren't there. It's only the fact that you're kind of doing the long stakeout, you know what I'm saying? Of the walking around the entire district, that you start noticing right. the patterns being a bit off. And this particular townhouse becomes of interest. Now it's become quiet. And then all of a sudden, a cart rolls up and a whole bunch of people come out with crates and a whole bunch of stuff and they just load up this cart they do it quickly they do it quietly they do it very efficiently and they even seem to have a bag that wiggles not flailing not not a bag that wiggles like not flailing not screaming like not oh help me that type of thing but they're you know there's the proverbial guy with a very big sack over a shoulder and one guy comes out and slaps it down and just kind of goes thud on the cart like it's grain. And another one goes thud on the cart like it's, you know, ka-ching, like gold. And another one goes thud on the cart and goes... I would want to check that out. Okay. Um. From your position, just wandering about or, you know, whether they see you, you're blending or at this point, whether you're hiding, um, you would literally have to bolt towards that cart to catch it because the la the very very last thing they put on that cart is the sack that goes oomph and then it's -ah and it starts heading down the street i chase after it okay so probably keep to the shadows and okay. not draw a ton of attention to myself mm-hmm not that hard to follow. They are doing your trick. We're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be in traffic. You know, it's like bad guys using a taxi or an Uber. You know, you don't know if there's a body in the trunk. You don't know if there's gold, ill-gotten gold in the trunk. That kind of thing. You know what I mean? They're using the city's civilization and system against it. They talk to watchmen. They have papers. You know, all that bit. They head all the way down to the docks. And they start unloading onto a ship. Is there always someone with the cart? Oh, yeah. This is like your assortment of like 20 dudes. It's way heavy guarded. Now they're smart. They don't have like 20 guys riding on here, but you know, two guys on the front, right? A couple guys in the back, the cart went and then other guys got on horses and like trailed. Cause when you follow that cart, by the time you get there on foot, other guys, other uh, of these men in dark clad armor that show up have all gotten there faster than you which means they've taken horses and cart whatever and they're all congregating and then when you get to the ship which is their point of you know let's unload here more you know they're, they're using sailors they have these guys and they just start offloading this cart onto a ship i would like to take the, the opportunity to use my um my tri uh feet which allows me to take a full round action and change my face 
Okay. I would like to change into a sailor. Okay. Hey, sailor. So that just. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. So um, I would turn into probably a young man, 20 something, strong looking sailor, um, and just walk up and, uh, hey guys, how can I help you out? Okay. Can I have a bluff check? That's a 16, and when I am using my feet, I get a plus one to that, so it would be a 17. All right. The guy looks you up and down, doesn't seem to recognize you, but then again, there's seems to be lucky for you, uh, taking your guess, the crew that's on foot with the cart aren't practically well known with the proverbial ship's crew. There's a lot of them. And like I said, you're dressed like a sailor. He just kind of looks at you like, oh, uh, yeah. You know, thinking you're a guy in the dock that's bored, a fellow sailor, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, he doesn't point you to help unload the cart, but there's regular sailor supplies and crates and hoists. And you know what I mean? He just puts you in line with guys that are helping on the dock. He doesn't give you a job where you board the ship. But there's certainly stuff around to help with the ship running and, you know what I mean, to be a cl lot closer. And he gives you one of those jobs. Right. Help screw these Maybe. lines, any other type of thing. But you're like way closer than you couldn't have got, that you could have gotten before. Right. Okay. So, I, would, I mean, I would do what they told me to do, but take the opportunity to observe what was going on. Sure. Can I have a couple of strength and dexterity checks so you don't screw up? And do you have any profession sale or anything to back this? Or anything to, to, up, to updo the expert that you said you're an expert on a whole bunch of things, right? Okay. Oh, um, I do actually. Okay. So, um, if I'm aiding anyone, um, so any profession checks, I can automatically take a 10 and help them. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. So you take your 10, you give somebody else a plus two. So you get in there instead of like picking your own line, you're like, oh, let me help you with this tow line, buddy. And you uh, pull on it with them or, you know, that type of thing mimic what they're doing and just lend a hand sure great yep. meanwhile back at the townhouse our pathfinders arrive well i'm going to what do we see do you want a perception check on that one? Oh well let's start with the classic box text sitting on the corner of a quiet street the red brick Declan townhouse melds into the middle class buildings in this portion of Absalon. A small flickering candle can be seen through a barred window on the building's west side, and a single door can be seen on the building's south face. You are on the scene, and our vigilante has witnessed something that happened a bit earlier that you guys have completely missed. And we will continue our edition right now but we're going to cap this episode so thank you for coming thank you for listening thank you for watching and we will see you next time on the man from Assyrian the Pathfinder Society edition the Infernal Vault say goodbye Mr. Willems bye <laughs>